see, before you pull that up, I have a plot to share. Done. It gets into some of what we're talking about today. Let me share that. It's not quite a nasty deed, but it is a fun little plot that uh, uh, my team struggled with. Mm -hmm. So no bearings on the inside. I was just going to say it's missing a lot of data. Li missing a lot, and 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 the one that really threw them for a loop is there's no centerline data to establish off of, and there's a dimension across the lot, but there is no determination of where PCs are. Mm -hmm. But we do have a radius point, so you know, maybe something there with, so. with a tie to the prop corner. Maybe does that say thirteen and a half feet? It says thirteen and a okay. half, I think, but I don't know if that's to the prop corner because that's kind of at a weird angle. It's not a quite perpendicular, and it doesn't seem yeah to be in line. Looks like that interior curve has got the PC and the PT with that long cord connected. Mm -hmm. Probably, so, so yeah, 112 so, down and then. So if it's an offset curves, then if those are concentric curves on the PC and the PT are going to be located radially from those uh, on the outside curves and center line curves are going to be coincident with or collinear with the uh, PC in the center of the curve. Yep. And then there's a trail that cuts through here. What, when was this done? When was this done? Uh, 47. 47? Hey, we were all born by then. <laughs> so. uh, except for Trent. <laughs> Both Trents. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, this is a fun one. I, we're doing a, a, a pretty big, this is an adjacent subdivision. We're doing a big survey for the school district and uh, just plugging in adjacents. The school district has like 18 parcels and they just did a, a combination deed that it's like 500 page document of all the school district properties. And they said, we're just combining them all. Here's every deed we have. And they just recorded the single document. So you can't even go through there and like just grab this school property. So we said, we'll just grab all the adjacent subdivisions and everything that's not a subdivision. That's got to be the school property, right? And uh, this is just happens to be one of them. So, so yeah. the 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 uh, stuff on the bottom, formerly Larson's subdivision, amended plat, none of that correlates backwards. Obviously, I haven't I haven't found it yet. Yeah, okay. that's that's next on the list here. But figured that'd be a fun one to to kind of start the discussion off today as we look at some really strange <laughs> things. Is, there's um, something with no bearings in it. So I had a similar problem with a subdivision that had some rather odd lines to it with no bearings. The only bearings were around the uh, perimeter of the subdivision. And uh, when you ran the uh, perimeter, it didn't close by about 20 feet. Mm -hmm. And as such, uh, with no bearings on the interior lots, there was one street down through the middle of all these lots. And surveyors had for about 40 or 40 years complained that the uh, whole thing had just been, uh, I don't know, uh, guessed at. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that the whole subdivision was, was based on what you... Uh, what you uh, uh, had possession of. And uh, when I got into it, I uh, I ran uh, lots and corners and stuff for about a day trying to make sense out of this whole line. And it turned out that there was a drafting error in the, in the thing. And one of the interior lines had been transposed with one of the... Uh, lines that was part of the perimeter and uh, when you changed that then everything fell into place all the lot lines <laughs> became the uh exactly what the surveyor had listed and uh, the whole thing fit together just crazy that's crazy <laughs> and it's wow, been that wow. way for about 30 or 40 years and then i got called on the survey by people outside the survey line uh, had been divided off into by a single owner that had owned the, the subdivision 
and divide the rest of his property in meets and bounds descriptions, and they had they wouldn't fit. And a lot of the owners were from out of state. He kept uh, the attorney that arranged all of this at a meeting one time, and they called me into it because I had done one of these lot surveys for a summer out there. And when I discovered the problem with subdivision, and uh, they they wanted me to change my bearings on my uh, uh, lot survey so that it would fit what they had been doing with trying to correct their problems for about two years without state owners. I told them, I said, there's no way. I said, the bearings on my lot are a part of the Southwest uh, projection for the uh, state plane coordinates for the South Zone. And I said, that's the only thing it's mentioned in the statutes. It's been developed from astronomic observations on the sun. I said, I'm not changing them. You change your stuff to meet the meet the state criteria, or you can continue with your with your uh, 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 adjusted or uh, uh, whatever uh, basis of bearings you want to use. I don't care. But I'm not changing my survey plat. <laughs> you can forget that. And when uh, they got kind of mad at me, but in the end, they they uh, they conformed to me. All good. It's always the fun fighting the fighting the city, fighting attorneys. Do plenty of that. Mm -hmm. Well, let's let's jump into it here. Chapter seven: Analysis and Interpretation of descriptions. Um, the the biggest thing that I wanted to kind of maybe spend some time talking about uh, is, is part A, sufficiency. We've, we've had a lot of discussion in this book about, you know, when you go to recreate a deed or put it on the ground, that you have to hold to the four corners of the document, right? And, and that is what controls, that's what we lay out on the ground. And, and, you know, and you gather then some of this other evidence outside of that, your field survey, your adjacent deeds, your adjacent subdivisions, other surveys, calls for adjoiners, whatever it might be. And we'll get into some of that evidence even in this chapter. But the one thing as a young surveyor that we never really talked about when we did training or mentoring is how do you know when it's not sufficient? Right. Sometimes it's glaringly obvious that, hey, this just doesn't close or it just doesn't fit or there's a bad call. And, and Waddles gives some examples in here. But sometimes it's a little bit more subtle than that. And that's where I think a lot of surveyors, young surveyors get tripped up for the first time is they don't know when to call a deed sufficient or not sufficient. And, and just like the plat I showed, a couple of the reasons I want to show that is one, it's, it's missing quite a bit of data, but really when I drafted that plot out, it's actually sufficient. I was able to get everything to close within tolerance for that time frame and, and get it to uh, um, map out on the ground and matched occupation and everything like that. So on the face of that plot, it would seem overly insufficient, but to uh, that's that's the discussion I kind of want to have reading some of what Waddles has in here and getting your guys' expertise of where, where is that line or what tools do you guys use to call something sufficient or insufficient? Um, so to get us started, I just wanted to read through a couple of things here that he had. Um, one of the first details to look for in analyzing any description is the matter of sufficiency. One of the primary questions is whether there are enough references to documents in the public office of records, including maps, and are they in turn sufficient? It is possible that the reference material has shortcomings, and if it is not satisfactory, then its value in the immediate description is questionable and the effect can be upsetting. A lack of or insufficient description of monuments can also create indefiniteness, ambiguity, whether it is the distance given or in the tie given or the material given for reference or in the absence of facts, all helps to diminish or negate the value of the description. 
insufficiency can even void a conveyance. So I throw it out to the group here since we've got a great group, a uh, large group again is what, what do you guys use to determine whether a deed is sufficient or insufficient or, or how would you train a young surveyor in that? I'm, uh, I'm just gonna throw out a red flag here. Um, there are some counties where they'll take your description, which is a completely sufficient description. They rewrite it, they abridge it for tax description. And then you see a series of conveyances using the tax description with all of the information stripped out of it. Now that doesn't necessarily mean at face value that it is an insufficient description, but it's a red flag, it's something to check. There have been times where I've had to go back in the record those four or five conveyances and find the prior description to figure out or to ensure that there weren't bounding calls that uh, that were missing. And and in one of those cases, the bounty call made all the difference on where the boundary was placed on the ground. Well, I, I see surveyors use that all the time out of just ease, right? It's easy to pull it off of a county parcel map and pull that tax description. That's, you know, certainly has some some deficiencies. Uh, I've never seen a uh, tax deed used in a to convey property in Arkansas, but uh, we have some really bad descriptions written by attorneys or uh, by the landowners themselves that uh, are, are really a problem. But generally, there's two classes. If if it's a quick claim deed, it better be right, or it's not going to fly. If it's a warranty deed, the court's going to bend over backwards to use any kind of means that you can refer to in any uh, recognized authority to to do that will delineate a particular piece of property. In other words, you can't say five acres within a 40 acre track without denoting where that five acre track is or what its shape is. But uh, along those lines, it would be insufficient. But if you can use any kind of uh, theory that's based on the law that indicates a particular piece of property, and it doesn't have to be exact, uh, Arkansas does not require the landowner to be exact in his description. In other words, his his uh, his uh, bearings and distances and whatnot may be uh, less than what a surveyor would want in precision. But uh, especially if it's an old deed from way back. Uh, is what you're basing your survey on, then it's going to be ruled sufficient. Uh, but if you're if you've got something that you can't pin it down in any way, face any uh, way at all to put to describe a particular piece of property, then you've got something that's insufficient, and it's not going to convey anything. Absolutely. Thank you, Jerry. You got your hand raised there. Hmm. It, I, a lot of it depends on what the surveyor is writing a description for. It, in Wisconsin, we don't normally write descriptions specifically for conveyance purposes. Uh, we write a lot of our descriptions for uh, the purposes of when we, when we do a resurvey of a property, we're required by administrative code, our minimum standards, to compose a description for that. And it, and it tells us it has to be sufficient to be able to retrace that description. Uh, subdivision plat, we have to write a, a perimeter description for that certified survey. Any type of product that we create, we write a description for. That doesn't mean that that description is going to be used the way we write it in a description. Once it leaves our hands, 
then then it does tur get turned into a tax description sometimes. But more often than not, an attorney or a title person will take it and will strip out some information that they don't feel is pertinent because that's just additional crap that goes out of that's only that doesn't really affect the, the the conveyance and all that kind of stuff. The other thing that we got to be careful of, and I, I, and I argue with surveyors on this all the time, is that when when we write a description, like say on a resurvey or on a plat of survey, surveyors will write a meets and bounds description on it, but they won't include calls for monuments because it's part of the map, and they say because it's attached to the map the information on a map becomes part of the description, which is true. But there's no guarantee that that description, even if an attorney takes it and uses it word for word, that the map's going to be included or referenced. So once that happens, there's a severance between the call for monuments and, a call for, and that description. So sometimes we have absolutely no control as to what happens with a description, you know, what the descriptions that we write. So what we write that may be sufficient for us because we're telling our, our surveyors of the future that we're creating the footsteps now that they're going to follow in the future, there's no guarantee that somebody's not going to come along and brush, out those, brush away those footsteps uh, before they get a chance to, to trace them all back to, to our product that we create today. Absolutely. There's a, there's a big push. I know we've tried a couple of times here in Utah to require descriptions to only be written by surveyors or to be stamped by surveyors, right? For that reason, because once it's stamped, it, it, it's a document that can be, cannot be changed, right? It's not a word document that gets manipulated or if someone rewrites it, there's clear evidence that that's a rewritten description because there is no stamp that accompanies it. Uh, Martina threw out in the, the chat here that she just saw a tax description this week that was the, the deed of record minus an important lesson accepting parcel. I, it's amazing how often I see it. It's, it's often homeowner uh, conveyances, you know, like a quick claim deed, and they're just giving it off to, to someone else, and, and they'll just pull the tax ID and not even pull their original deed um, to pull that off of, and that's always a challenge. Um, to Jerry's point, one of my least favorite, one of my favorite tasks are ALTA surveys. I love doing them. They're one of my favorite things to do, but I hate doing them on commercial properties because often there's some sort of cross access or utility easements. And they, they're probably an 11 by 17 copy of, you know, the commercial site plan. And they've got the bearings and distances written around it. And it's got the shaded where the, you know, the access should be through the shared access. And then they scale that down to an 11 by 17 and then copy it and then scan it into the record. And they're absolutely not usable, right? You can't see it. All you can see is just shades of lines and no text. And 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 kind of to, to prove Jerry's point there is, is you don't know what gets copied or, or gone or even maps that are there or references to maps that don't get attached to that. So... I love that analogy. We don't know who's sweeping away our footsteps. <laughs> yeah. That was a pretty good one. I like that one. You know, I actually came up against a project recently where a title company was claiming that a boundary description was not sufficient. And they wanted me to rewrite it and to remove uh, some of the bounding calls. This was it was it wasn't a difficult description it was the west 200 feet of the north half of the southeast quarter of the southeast quarter that's north of a certain road you find your aliquot lines you find your road right of way and there you go you've got your 200 feet it's very straightforward and they kept you know pushing back that they needed a new description and so the way i ended up rewriting it was including the original description also described as but ultimately like you're saying, Jerry, I don't know what all, what got recorded. And hopefully they intelligently used the signed and sealed copy that I sent to them and said, put this in as your exhibit A, uh, because that that would have kept, that would have maintained the uh, calls to section, quarter section and 40 acre lines that, that mattered in that description. 
the, probably the best reassurance I ever saw on a deed was a description that was put there by an attorney at the end. The attorney put down, the attorney of record for this document does not take any responsibility for this description as it was supplied by a surveyor. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I like that, that description uh, I trust. <laughs> we have a kind of a uh a cross there between what Jerry works with and, and what we have here in in the law and uh, to prepare a conveyance in Arkansas, you have to be either the landowner yourself or an attorney at law. No other person can do a conveyance. And any attorney that writes it on description is on the hook. And you can bet that there's not hardly one that you can find in Arkansas that'll write his own description anymore. He wants a surveyor and a survey in his files before he does conveyance and uses that description. And he will not change that a single word in it He'll do it just as you gave it to him. And because any other deviation makes him uh, subject to the liability of the problem. And if you have a, uh, a, a title company complain about uh, the insufficiency of a deed, I would tell them right quick, uh, I'll write a description on a piece of property for an attorney to do a quick, a, uh, 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 a court case for a quiet title operation, and then you can use it in your conveyance. But until so, uh, you're you're out of luck. So uh, we'll let Jerry. I've got a question follow up on that, James. But Jerry, go ahead. You had your hand raised. And I, I just want to point out one thing. Talking about the difference uh, that James was talking about, and that's. This is another one, re another reason that like when people have licenses from all these different jurisdictions, there's all these little differences that make that, that are different. They gotta be responsible. Anyway, when I when I was getting ready to do a presentation in, in Nevada, and I was digging through your guys' statutes and stuff, I came across a statute that says any description that's not written by a land surveyor has that has to accompany it the name and the address of the person that wrote the description, which I thought is a great idea. If that description is going to be written by somebody that's not a surveyor, let's find out who wrote the actual description. And now the recorders almost, we got to sign and seal every, every legal description for the transactions. Now too, we're getting anything that's even on older deeds. If they're going through some transactions, we're mm -hmm. having to uh, sign and seal them again. So, geez, before you know, without well, a Torrance title system, huh? <laughs> <laughs> a couple hundred years later. <laughs> so the, the question I have, and, and and Jerry and James brought up, kind of got my mind going here, is uh, those that are from other states, do we know what's required? You know, who can who can record the deed, whether it's either just the landowner or attorney with that? But do you guys know how that works in your states? Do we have some differing, differing situation, differing, different situations, um, differing situations uh, in other states that are represented here today? I just had a discussion about this yesterday uh, in California. We got a request for a proposal to do a big series of legal descriptions because. Uh, a large municipal client was uh, updating uh, deeds and they needed to add restrictions to the property uses and they're approaching us to rewrite all the, the legal descriptions. And actually a couple of surveyors in the office started arguing about why are they having us rewrite the legal descriptions um, to, till we finally pointed out that in order to have a successful conveyance or reconveyance or adding a deed restriction uh, information uh, to a conveyance, they have to have a valid legal description. And recorder's offices as of late have actually started paying attention to the fact that nobody but a land surveyor can write a legal description. So they will not record a deed 
that has a brand new legal description, but is not signed and sealed by a, a land surveyor. Uh, some counties are a little better at, enforce, at enforcing this than others. Um, so we're a little spoiled in that way that only surveyors can uh, write legal descriptions in the state. But I was surprised that, couple, that some of the licensees actually were not up to speed with that. Um, so we had a little bit of a heated discussion where I had to pull up the the PLS Act and a couple other snippets of code that explain how it works. It's good job security too, right? If we're the only ones that can do it. Mm -hmm. But uh, to your earlier point about uh, what's necessary in a legal, legal description lately, my mantra has been, it has to be locatable on the ground uh, at, at least through some of the existing records, uh, if not uh, just within four corners of the document. And obviously it has clear, it has to be clear and unambiguous in what it is that it describes. Yeah, I've, I've said it here before, and, I, and this is kind of my mantra is, is, can I take that deed and walk the ground with it, right? Or can a landowner walk the ground? Assuming that all the corners were in or or some calls for adjoiners or monuments, could you take that and walk it and figure it out within a reasonable amount? It, it's not something you're going to build off of per se, but could you walk that to a reasonable location and say, hey, here's the property corner. I get it. I, I know where it is, or at least I should be in the right area, right? And that's a good jumping off point for sure. Okay. Um, let's let's keep going here. Uh, Waddles gives a couple of examples here of some good, better, best, starting with a bad description. This right at the bottom of uh, 7.2, he says, beginning at the southerly terminus, of course, number 21 of lot 10, said point of beginning being the most westerly corner of land described indeed to our brothers. You know, and he, he kind of gives some examples of why that's not a great one. And then, then he gives another one. And, and then about the middle of page 7.3 says, another point of insufficiency, which makes for poor understanding is the improper positioning of those items, which control the location of the particular piece of land in relation to the description as a whole. Uh, sometimes the description will wander all over the area before it describes other pinpoints, the actual ties and pertinent items that control the boundary. So then he gives right there in the middle, right where his uh, transcursor is, right? He gives another description of it. And when he kind of, then he, he critiques himself again. He says, from all this, you still do not know where you are without getting from the deed in the, without getting the deeds and maps, if any, and drawings, if any, and drawings all the parts. The preferable way would thus be this. And so he gives this very robust description of this, of this line. And then on the next page, he kind of just summarizes all this up. He says, uh, in the last form, it is possible to visualize the development of that parcel from a known point, having to search for ties to monuments or adjoiners or anything by which to pin down a line or corner proves insufficient of the description. The lack of sufficiency could invalidate the title. And so he, he kind of gives this great, that's a great little exercise to go through to see, you know, a good, better, best description and really make sure it's clear. And then the next point he brings up are, are conflicting elements. How many guys, how many of us have found deeds that just, they say opposite things within there? Um, and so how do we, how do we determine that? How, this is all kind of a, a, an exercise in, in what do we do next when we find those? Well, I've, I've had a lot of deeds that uh, on their face, the first time you read them, they looked like they had a lot of conflicts within them. But uh, later on, uh, I've been able to uh, come up with a reasoning that uh, sorted out the intent of the grantor uh, and uh, and go forward with the survey. That's that's not always the case. I've had one or two in 
in my career that I had to just go back to the attorney and say, hey, fellows, uh, you're going to have to do a quiet title operation right here. This thing won't fly. I can't make it fly. Get you another surveyor or get ready to go to court. And, and Joe, Joe, I'm just picking up on some of the side conversation here. He shared a map. Um, let me, can I share, Trent? Can I steal that from you? Let me pull this up here. Joe, you want to kind of walk us through what, what we've got here and what your question was and, and some of the side discussion going on about this map? Me? Me? Yeah. Well, Joe, well, Joe just threw up the, uh, the description. Uh, and it referenced the map, and I just asked him uh, when the map was from, and he put this up because uh, I was wondering if it was one of those older maps, something similar like what you had shown, where it just showed the, you know, a couple of dimensions because it was an older type of map. But he shows a 1999 map, and he put this up, and I noticed down the corner it says a property inventory map, which uh, unless they've I I, I that might be something that a company has for its own purposes for a, a map index of, of properties and that type of thing. But I don't think that's a legal document of any sort that you, you can reference. And unless it's like an inter intermediate reference to something else, unless those, uh, pars those are parcel IDs on it or something that refer back to uh, a description somewhere else in that type of thing. So I, I, I don't know that well, you, you'd kind of have to pull up his description also that he had in reference to this map. Let's see if I can, maybe I can get I'll, part I'll of back, back a couple of, of uh, comments before that. Oh, you don't want to put me up there. That's, 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 I'm ambiguous to begin with. <laughs> there. there we go. Jerry, Jerry, it looked like on the map in the upper left, it said it had a list. It said um, list of properties to be acquired or something. So maybe it was just. Yeah, well, see, it, it, we, we, if you haven't read the legal description, because it talks in there about a future survey. Yeah. So, so I think the, I saw that too. Yeah. So the thing is, it's. It's describing something, but it's like it's going to be refined by a later survey. So it's like a, a call for survey for a survey that doesn't exist yet. Well, yeah. It, then it says, it, also known as Lot 24 on this tax map. So it goes from bad to worse. I mean, neither of those are a conveying document. Yeah, yeah, and that's uh, it's and that's what I was trying to figure out when that first document I referred to was if that was something that was tied back to an old document that was back when they didn't have all the but it, but whoever wrote this, it looked like they grabbed whatever they saw that had the the parcel on a map appearing somewhere and just decided to lump it all together into a description. And so oh, by the way, we'll, we'll eventually have a survey done. We we in in Wisconsin and I think other DOTs probably have this too. They might you might come right away plats. We have a transportation project plats, which is a plan for future acquisition, and it is a plat map. It's recorded, but it's not land that the DOT currently owns. It's the instrument by which in the future they will acquire land for projects. So it's kind of like a pre-plat type of situation. So. Those boundaries don't exist yet, but when they acquire the land, then a, then a full survey is performed and the deed is executed and all that kind of stuff. So if this is kind of something like that where this is a kind of a plan of stuff we're going to acquire or we're in the process of acquiring, but we're going to have the survey come later. The interesting thing is, Joe, maybe you can answer this. Um, all these have what look to be recording information. Like, you know, top of this one says, uh, I'm guessing it's book and page 5388, 260, or volume and page, whatever the, the, the reference system is out there. And, and the property map, the, the inventory map had a deed book and page 396, 3096, page 57. You know, that was written on there, but maybe not as a recorded document or a file document. Um, 
you know, the one that we're showing now looks like a title report, but it's interesting that it has, it seems to have been filed or recorded in some, some method. And uh, can you speak yeah, to that? It was, show or? Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, I, I had pulled this, we weren't doing a survey of this parcel itself. We were doing a, a survey of a neighboring parcel and I was just trying to get some deeds. And I, I pulled this and I ran up to my boss. I was like, how is this legal? Because I pulled the map right away and I was like, well, this is not a, you know, a filed map. This isn't a subdivision map. This is just, hey, we have these bunch of properties and this is a map of them. How is this legal description referencing this map and how is this legal? Um, and my boss first said, uh, yeah, it was probably written by a, a, an attorney and it's has this note about an accurate survey on there. So let's not worry about it. Let's just keep going. So I just wanted to bring it up. And show you that yeah there's not only just referencing um tax maps but they're also referencing you know maps that just these big industries have uh multiple properties of two it's like okay well it's gonna take i what i believe happened is this fell into a sheriff's sale and then the the industry the pure land industry company came in and was buying up all the parcels in that area and uh, an attorney just wrote a nice legal description for us to follow in the future. Well, well, thankfully, the property inventory map was done by a licensed engineer. Because yeah. <laughs> we all yeah. know they do great surveys. Yep. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I threw that in the chat. Yeah, thanks, Brian. I liked it. Yeah. Okay. So so sometimes we have we have conflicting information. Um whether it's, uh, you know, it looks to be parallel or not parallel, the bottom of, of page uh, 7.4 here, um, he says, when the point of commencement is intended to be on the southeasterly pro prolongation of a line, it is not parallel with and along the easterly line of lot three because it is outside of lot three. When the lot is on a 40 degree diagonal, the sideline is not westerly along the southerly line. It would be the southwest, it would be southwesterly along the southeasterly line um, when there are no bearings shown on the lot lines on the track map. But bearings were derived somehow by someone for use in the description. Then they should not have been, should not be related to some former line of control, like a street line, and not drop out of clear sky in the middle of the description onto a new line having no qualification. And so we just kind of have to be careful about some of those languages and we calls we have to make sure we're consistent with that. Um, so there's some 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 ideas on on conflicting evidence, conflicting elements. Um, yeah, I'll jump in right here. On this one right here is the one that I got hung up on right quick. Uh, one of the things that I like to see with with professional land surveyor is that you can get two or three together to do the same uh, description and all arrive at the same place on the ground. Uh, when you do that, uh, uh, you lend a lot of uh, uh, credibility to your work to uh, private citizens and and to the court and attorneys. Uh, when everybody winds up with a different place, uh, things get kind of muddy. Uh, and this particular one right here, Waddle seems to say that uh, uh, it's really a terrible deed uh, and, and can't be exactly set on the ground. And I don't find that to be so. Uh, granted, uh, when it starts right there, it leaves you kind of scratching your head maybe about how to get from lot three down to the point of beginning. But the deed does reference lots three and lots four in a certain subdivision. Uh, and those can be located uh, and set on the ground. The corners there that are that are represented and and shown in the in the little dry drawing that uh, Wallace provides, uh, I don't I I can't see that there would be a problem there. Uh, 
when I look at this deed right here, unless there is something numerically wrong with the distances or numerically wrong with what's given in the uh, uh, bearings and distances there, uh, I, I don't have a problem with it. I think every surveyor ought to come out with the very same uh, results whenever he does this. And and you've got to start with lots three and four. And uh, supposedly you would be able to to reference those on the ground with uh, uh, the corner of uh, common to lots three and lot four on the south end uh, being a particular point right there. Uh, now to get to the point of beginning, which is down close to uh, where the B shows up in the diagram, uh, you have to go 54 feet. Uh, but you can go to the end of the description of this property, and that point is to be perpendicular to the back line that's 115.20 feet. Uh, and I don't see anything there that would be amb ambiguous about the location of that point of beginning. Uh, it does say that it would be parallel to uh, the line common to lots three and four, and it should be if that's says, so stated in the deed. But really, the perpendicular to the line as it's run on the ground uh, satisfies me as to the point of beginning that's fixed. And if you start there and you label these uh, corners of this property uh, around the perimeter, you wind up with eight points, uh, point one being uh, the point of beginning at, at near uh, where B occurs on the drawing, uh, two being uh, that distance of 161, whatever, uh, then uh, south 56 feet something uh, to point number three, and then through a series of uh, but, uh bearings and distance to point number four, five, six, and seven is uh, common to the southeast corner of lot four. And point number eight is there common to point uh, to the lot corner of three and four on the south side. Uh, now, Doing the first part of it right there, you all have to work off of lots three and lot four. The point number one being perpendicular, 54 feet from uh, the south line of lot four. I don't see anything ambiguous about there. And then from one to two is to be parallel to the south line of lot three. I don't see anything ambiguous ambiguous about where point number two is at. Point number three is south so many feet, and that might be a little bit ambiguous there because you don't know what that is. But the rest of that, of the bearings and distances that go back up to point number seven, from three to seven, that bearing is in distances, although as one points out, it has a basis of bearings that just falls out of the sky. Well, that's talking about what it's not, but what it is is a shape and scale of a section of sections of lines that are hooked together. And if you ran that, you would get a distance between point number three and point number seven. Uh, and th that forms a kind of a piece there that can be fit to the puzzle. If you have point number three effective on the ground and you have point number seven on the ground, point number, I mean, point number two, then point number three should be at 56 point, what is it, 80 feet distance. And the distance between 
three and seven should intersect that. In other words, you should be able to do a distance instance intercept there to make all of that fit. And it will fit unless there is some kind of bust in there in the numerical data that's provided in the D. So I, I'm expecting every surveyor to go out there and put that on the ground in the same place. And if you can do that, the uh, description is not insufficient. It's perfectly sufficient. And everybody should uh, come up with the same result. Uh, there might be a problem in that the word south may not fit the basis of bearings and all the other bearings and distances that fit around there because it doesn't fit the same form. If it said south zero degrees, zero minutes east, 50.80 feet, then I would say that it fits with the same uh, basis of bearings as the rest of the cause. But since it doesn't, then uh, I'm going to use a bearing uh, distance distance intercept there to, to figure out where point number three belongs. Well, and, James, I'll, I'll argue with you just a little bit. And I think this is what Waddles is trying to trying to point out is, is it's just the point of beginning does have some question in there because he's saying uh, parallel with and along the easterly line of, of lot three. And the point of beginning technically is not along, it's, it's along the extension of, right? So if you were to just take, take this document at face value and walk out to the ground, I, I think that's the point, right? Is, is, that's is a you need more information. I agree with you that it is sufficient because we could recreate it on the ground, but the point Waddles was trying to make is if you just read it at face value, you would almost want to start at the southeast corner of lot three because you're he's saying to go along along a lot line and you're actually going past and outside the lot line. But well, once you plot well, it and look at all the evidence, I think it is very retraceable. Yes, well, I, I, you're right there that starting out the description is a little bit vague about how to get from that lot corner down to the point of beginning. And that's but his point. Don't, that was his point. I don't, he wasn't talking yeah. about the rest of the lot. But, but he that, point out that point of beginning. But yeah. that, that completely ignores the fact that the court has told us that we can go back to the end. We can run this backwards and instead of forwards. And when we look at the end of it, then it becomes very certain because that point of beginning is perpendicular to the uh, lot line across four. And that line is, is spelled out perfectly in the, uh, uh, in the description where it is, what it is, how long it is. And that the, uh, Point of beginning is 54 feet perpendicular to that line to the southeast. So there's there's not any ambiguity in there to me. Uh, the point of beginning, once it's established by that means, there's nothing in the other thing there that that's really conflicts with that point. Uh, it, it's it, it's a little maybe vague in and how to starting out there, how to get to the point of beginning. But it's not when you look at the end. And what the courts have told us is, look at the entire deed from corner to corner. And you go back and look at the end of the description, and it will tell you exactly where that point of beginning is without any ambiguity. Yep. No, you're, you're right. And I agree. He just pointed out that it does conflict just the beginning to the end, but it is retraceable. So, Brian, to your point that you threw out there in the chat, wouldn't the point of bed point of beginning point of beginning be better said the continuation of the direction? I typically use the extension of extension know, of, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Any of those would work to then describe and clarify what the intent was for the for the point of beginning there. Absolutely. I just like I don't like the word parallel there. I just don't like it. Yeah, we've talked about that in previous sessions here, parallel with, parallel along, you know, all those type of ones can introduce ambiguity. When we did, I think it was chapter five, 
you know, with all the curves and stuff, there's quite a bit of discussion we had about some of those qualifying calls and how they can introduce some ambiguities or questions in there because they can be interpreted different ways. So I, I agree with you there, absolutely. I, I think the point of this example is to demonstrate that since there is an amb ambiguity at the POB and even though the rest of the description, it can back be backed in and, and the description can eventually be located on the ground, uh, the attention needs to be paid to the fact that there is an amb ambiguity at the beginning because if you continue writing the descriptions like that without paying attention to the amb ambiguities, what happens if you introduce three ambiguities in three different places and now the description cannot be backed in anymore. So this is a drawing attention to the fact that you need to be careful about what you say regarding every, every element that you talk about, even though in this particular case, the deficiency still made it, uh, still allowed the description to be retraceable. That may not always be the case, even with the exact same wording in, um, in the introduction, in, in setting up of the POB. Also, well said, say and how Thank you say you. it also. Uh, what I read in here is this is one of Waddle's favorite chapters. He has the most colorful verbiage in this in this chapter than any of the other ones that I've read so far. So you can tell he's having a good time with this. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well he started to 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 take all the elements we've learned because the next few pages, right? The last half of this chapter is everything he's trying to teach us. He's he's repeating it all and pounding it into our heads, right? Right. So. Well, one of the things there, and and I do agree that uh, all of professional surveyors should write a better description than the one provided here. Uh, I would hope that we all do a better job than that, but we have to be prepared to handle these kind of descriptions, and then. One goes on, and he tries to give us an example of how he would write the description for that particular piece right there. But uh, there is a place when you get to the next page that uh, he, uh, in in closing back the thing, I think he uh, says uh, southeasterly when it or northeasterly, where he meant northwesterly in his description. So uh, the the first one there is placeable on the ground. The one that he writes for us definitely, I think, has a has a problem. Flip to the next page, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Oh. Uh. Yeah, up there at the at the top there, when he gets back and he talks about the prolongation of the northeasterly line of lot three. Oh, four, there four is, lines down, yeah. There is no northeasterly line of lot three. It's a southeasterly or northwesterly line of lot three. That's just plain wrong. Yeah, he's talking about that line from the, yeah, you go back there to that uh, page before that. Yeah, but right there, uh, the line that's common to lots three and four is what he's talking about there, uh, where it goes back towards where block seven is written. Uh, he, he, uh, he describes that as a, as a northeasterly line instead of a northwesterly line. Uh, it's a simple well, north, mistake. Northeasterly line of three would be correct because that's the east side of lot three. You're taking lot three and going down. So it would I would call it the easterly line of three. And then you're going southeasterly along that that line, the prolongation of that line, 54 feet. That makes sense to me. Uh, okay, I see what you're saying there. Let's not forget that we got a room full of surveyors, and we're all going to disagree on exactly how this is supposed to be written. 
That's what? that's right. Thanks, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, Jeremy. Whatever we write, every one of us needs to be able to go out there and put that on the ground with the same place. If we don't, we're, we're causing ourselves a problem. And I think that's the takeaway. I, I think we've we've gone through these conflicting elements. He does another little example there, but but to what Connie said and and to kind of put a bow on this is is we can look as professionals and with training, and we can take a deed that has problems in it and draw out correct elements and make it correct, even though it's it's got ambiguities or conflicting things in there. But the thing we have to, to remember, and, and we keep going back to this now. Now, the book is called Writing Legal Descriptions, but we spent the last seven chapters talking about how we interpret legal descriptions, right? He's, he's in many ways, never really told us this is how you write it. There's a couple examples in there. Um, but what we need to do, what we need to learn in this is in, in reading bad examples and reading good examples or good, better, best examples is we have to take this and say, we can write a deed that works and is good enough, but we have to look at every individual element and realize that as we write them, we look at each line in that description, right? And, and these are great examples of that if we read them in in their their entirety again as trained surveyors we can we can figure it out but we have to also assume that an untrained person is reading them um, and jerry you're absolutely right jerry just said you can't separate writing from interpreting if you're going to write them correctly that, that's that's absolutely right uh, let's jump a couple pages over i'm not going to go over this um this other example he's got here in conflicts um, but this is where he gets kind of, he gets going over things again that he, he already did, but he, he does uh, throw some shade at the bottom of 7.6, the second to last paragraph, actually the, the last two, the, the third to last paragraph there, he says the brevity, simplicity, and completeness of the second description that we didn't go over here is easier to understand, has less chance of error, and is less costly to record. Um, and so just a point of, point of order there to remember is how we write those has, has a lot um, of consequences. And then he says, perhaps the old timers should not be blamed too much for their verbose language, considering that they were paid only two cents per word for writing a description. After all, they had to earn a living. Exclamation point, <laughs> right? Um, and I didn't know that. I don't remember reading that before, and, and I didn't know that they got paid per word or anything like that, or if that was actually a real thing. So, I'm sure that's a facetious comment. Uh, I'm sure it is, but uh, who knows? <laughs> yeah. Hey, I mean, I'll, I'll I'll throw shade at reviewing surveyors. We actually had a great discussion in our conference a couple of weeks ago. We had a city surveyors class, and we talked about how they review things on state code versus maybe what UCLS the standard is. And, you know, we definitely got a, um, not just surveyors, but in the engineering world or, or, or things like that, there are people that get paid per comment, right? And it's, it's sometimes reflected in what we get back. And I know Jeremiah is a part-time <laughs> county surveyor, so I'll throw him under that bus. I am not <laughs> paid by comment. <laughs> in, in, in fact, I, I had a conversation just today with the county recorder telling her I need to do less for my reviews and limit what I'm doing. And she agrees with me. But the the I irony here is she asked me to do all of those things to begin with. So <laughs> yeah, David's a, uh, David works for the county as well. So, you know, but it's, it's those contract ones. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Jeremiah. I, I like working with Jeremiah. So I, <laughs> I got to tease him. But uh, um, all in uh, good getting, humor. <laughs> getting back. I'm adding the, four more comments to your next review. <laughs> uh, um, all in caps. Back, all in caps. <laughs> all in caps, yeah. Uh, jumping back into the book here is he talks about some of these things that help make a, a description really strong. Um, and, the, and the first one he, he cites is 
adjoiners, call to adjoiners. He starts out saying, why the citation of a definite monument carries high priority, still a call to adjoiner is in itself a call to a monument and where it is certain, it is held in high dignity. Calling for a well-known line of another tract denotes the intention. And that's the important thing to point out here is it, anytime we can convey what the intention is, right? So it denotes the intention of the party with equal strength to calling for a natural boundary so long as that line can be proved. So this is stuff we've already reviewed in, in other chapters, but calls for adjoiners, that makes it very clear. Uh, and so the question I throw out here is, and I, I'm changing how I do this a little bit, but I'm curious, I want to get your guys' to advice is, how do you call for adjoiners? What is your standard procedure for that? It could be as simple as calling out the right of way, right? Easterly, northerlies, right of ways. I mean, and it could be as as uh, detailed as the deed recording information as well, right? So it's so that southwest corner of that parcel recorded under deed, you know, recording information, blah blah blah. So and you can make it as verbose as you want to. Yeah. But the the important the, the point is use the adjoiners if, if you got them yeah and you can and you can call it what they are then use them otherwise you might not be going to that going to that joiner liner so yep i i i've uh i've gotten more verbose in how i do it i i definitely try to make a as as i've learned and grown i i'm trying to get more and more into calling to this parcel with here's all the recording information that I referenced, right? Making it very clear to someone else, this is the document I went to for this. Because again, I could call to an adjoiner, but if that adjoiner changes, owner changes or anything like that, calling to the document that I used makes their job so much easier if someone was, were to retrace it. Just be sure to tell your mentees as you bring on new, new surveyors that when they do their research, it's to not stop at the fact that there's a call for a joiner to establish whether that's a junior or senior adjoiner. A call for a joiner is not always a call to a senior property. So you still have to do the research to go back to see where that adjoiner came from. Great point. Thanks, yeah. Jeremiah. Go ahead. Yeah, and, and I was going to mention that that same thing. Uh, calling to an adjoiner doesn't necessarily affect a junior or senior right, but it it gives it it at, it can add an element in the record that wasn't there before and so it's i feel comfortable calling to an adjoiner if i know that my property uh is 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 not the senior right or if i'm not sure now waddles points out in this chapter that he doesn't like to the grantor's west line um i don't like that either but i've used on occasion to the west line of the property conveyed in a deed and so I'll identify again, like you were saying, Trent, the recording information that that the chain of title has already given me to determine where that line is. Um, but generally, unless it already calls for an adjoiner, I've got to have a really good reason to want to call to that adjoiner, or or a really good reason to not call to the adjoiner. It, it, it really there's there's no easy easy answer for that one, unfortunately. I don't think not for me. Yeah. And he gets into that that calling to the grantors. And the only time I call to a grantors line is on easements as a general rule, because I'm bounding this easement within a property and that he's only granting what's inside his property. Um, but definitely there are some other calls in there. And that's just a semantics in my head. But that's that's the only time you might see me call to a, a grantors line is 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 on an easement that's bound inside some sort of ownership and not a, a parcel or a, a conveyance document. So on, on that note, I love it when a surveyor has written a description, has not filed a survey, and has done a series of things to his calculations that make that description not match the original record. <laughs> So in this case, I, I saw this earlier this week. The surveyor had written a description and rotated everything to the center line of a road. And everything along the road is 
tied to the road, but everything is tied to the road using north as the bearing. And so the title company, when they got a hold of the the deed and the easement, they they don't know what basis of bearings means. They don't know how to rotate things. They don't even know where north is. It, it's up, you know, right? So they were plotting this and saying there was a problem with the easement. But if you look at the information that came along with it, you can tell, you can see what this surveyor was trying to accomplish, but his description doesn't say that. His description doesn't monument or, or, or memorialize the, the intent to follow the north line of the property. And so they were claiming that the easement was going over into the neighbor's property when once you've looked at his exhibit, it clearly wasn't. Now, this also speaks to the importance of having a survey if you're going to do an as surveyed description, because he was just rotating title elements without ever analyzing where the actual boundary line of this property was on the ground. And that ended up causing an additional ambiguity in the record. Um, so know, know where you are before you tell people where to go. I like it. I like it. Thanks, Jeremiah. Now, Brian, you've been holding out on us here. So Brian is the the Connecticut State Surveyor. So that's, thanks for joining us. That's not many states can say that. So that's pretty cool. That's, I wish Utah had one of those too. So. Well, thank you. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Wait, yeah, I'll make things awkward here for you. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, put me on the spot. My weird accent from Connecticut. That's uh, okay. We won't hold it against you. Uh, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm a good guy. <laughs> I drove through your state last summer. Does that matter? Oh, cool. <laughs> from, yeah, New York, <laughs> from yeah, right from New York to uh, Massachusetts. There you go. Nice, mm -hmm. Brian. Is that a, an elected position or is that an appointed position? Uh, it's appointed. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, actually, I'm um, I'm. Uh, my so DOT has surveyors. I am actually DEP or Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. Um, we we um, have 265,000 acres of property that is under our care and custody um, that I have uh, control over. Nice. Yeah. 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 Appointed by yeah. the governor or appointed by? Uh, so I, I was hired by by the DEP. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yep. Crazy. So, yeah, I need, um, expert testimony, I, what, whatever, whatever is required. Um, but but what, what's really interesting, you guys will all laugh at this. I am a surveyor of one for two hundred sixty-five thousand acres. <laughs> Holy crap! Wow. That, that yes. is that's intense. okay. I thought you were the only surveyor in Connecticut, so <laughs> uh, well, it might as well be. <laughs> <laughs> oh good well let, let's jump back in here we've got a couple more things to cover we may actually finish this chapter if we roll through this I know, talk look at about that. a lot of this stuff and we've had great discussion tonight too yeah. which is awesome um so uh I mean, we've talked about calls to joiners and then calls to artificial things um and that's one that we've talked about quite a bit here it's, it's one that i'm still trying to figure out in my practice are we calling to, you know, a rebar that you set. I'll call to rebars that other people set that I find in the course of my survey that, that are relevant to that. Um, but he says, regarding control by artificial monuments and marks, Corpus Jura states that after natural and permanent objects, artificial monuments and marks, unless clearly erroneous control, other and inconsistent calls for boundaries, provided the monuments are mentioned in the deed, the rule has no application to a description in a deed which does not mention any monuments. Um, and and so if it's if it's not mentioned in that description, unless it's tied to some sort of map or anything else, and that that extrinsic ex evidence, it's you know it it doesn't have much weight according to Waddles there. And then just like artificial monuments or natural monuments, and we get into maps, plats field notes, um, and we've talked at length about that. And it it's very much like these calls to the joiners. You've got to call out that information and make it clear what you're 
uh, using and how you're using it and where you get to that information and, and looking at junior and senior rights like we've talked about already. Um, and then meets and bounds. In the matter of conflict between reference to the facts shown on a map and a meets and bounds description of the same area, there are also two approaches he says in Goldsmith versus Philman, the court held that meets and bounds description around a block of lots which disagreed uh, with the boundary of that block shown on the map referred to in the same deed would give way to the measurement shown on the plan. Um, and so we've talked at length about, you know, is it a call directionally that's, that's more correct, but the, the distance is off, and so you hold that. Um, or is it, you know, the direction is off, but the distance might be correct. I'm doing one right now where it's, it's very much like the one Jerry had thrown into the chat earlier, where it just said diagonally along, right? It was easterly along a section line, south so many chains, and then southwesterly so many chains, and, and neither distance or bearing held, but if I backed it around from the beginning backwards, you know, we were able to kind of close that one out and fit occupation, but, you know, you've got to look at those as a whole picture and decide which elements you might want to hold or look at and then justify that on the face of your survey, right? And then getting back to how do we write that, being very clear, you know, we're not just calling southwesterly along something because there's there's a lot of interpretation in Southwesterly. We looked a few chapters ago about <laughs> what Southwesterly is. What are the angles of that, right? It's like a 30 degree angle that, that Waddles gave us um, that Southwesterly encompasses. And then uh, natural permanent things, uh, you know, calls to, you know, a river, um, creek, trees, things that are permanent, marked or surveyed lines, uh, and then ties. He says on page 713, normally a tie or call given in description to an adjoiner deed or a physical monument, a railroad right away, etc., means that whatever distance and or bearing, depending on the wording given for the tie, is measured on the ground to that tie will hold. If there is another form or call, however, that results in a different application, um, there is another form of call, however, that results in a different application if it is written thus. He says, thence easterly 116.74 feet along the south line of said lot to a point, which is also westerly 64.78 feet from the southeast corner of said lot. Um, see a lot of those descriptions where they call back to something, right? Thence along the line varying distance to a point, which is ties back to a section corner, varying distance to a section corner, right? So it's it's double tied to different section corners. Um, and then uh, mistakes. He says mistakes occur in descriptions for various reasons, such as typographical errors, lines omitted, misreading of someone's writing, or even errors in mathematics used in preparation of the description. Uh, he actually goes through and gives an example of a deed that was written backwards and then rewritten, you know, and and when they took and reorganized that deed, you know, there was two calls put um, out of order, right? But then when you looked at it as a whole, you could kind of determine how to put it back together. So rolling through those a lot pretty quick here because we've talked about quite a few of those. We've talked quite a bit about mistakes. Um, so that reverse order one was on page 716. I'm really cruising through here, guys. So stop me if we want to kind of hit on one of those. Um, I just feel we've talked quite a bit about it. And then the last part of the chapter here is, is kind of some newer material uh, starting on page uh, 716, the bottom of 716 and going through the rest of the chapter. We're talking about proportional measurements, um, simultaneous conveyance, um, remnant theory, apportionment theory. And that's the stuff that I don't think we'll get into. Now that I'm remembering that's at the back end of here, that's probably one we push for another week because that, that will take a, a good chunk of class here. So there's a lot really fast there. <laughs> yeah, I would say we'd hold off on some of that for... Yeah. Because there's some good 
that's needs to have a lot of conversation there. I, I agree. I forgot that that was at the back half when we started the discussion today. Yep. So Yep, yep. So great discussion, guys. Any other questions, comments, or concerns about the, the first half of Chapter 7? That was the easy part. Yep. <laughs> just, just be careful, according to Waddles, by referring to something by one half. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay, so we're looking at. I, I saw the chat was going pretty. pretty that was, that so was I, some other. I was talking as fast as the chat was going. <laughs> that, was, that was nothing to be concerned about in the chat. <laughs> I, I like so 312 surveyors in, in Connecticut, Connecticut, 264 in Nevada. So, so I'm a weird freaking number. And when Jeremiah said, How many per square mile? I already have this shit broken out by. <laughs> the western 13 states and so when you ask that question i i already have that per capita surveyors per capita surveyors per capita per firm <laughs> i do all that shit so and i was in north carolina a couple of weeks ago and i did the same thing there's like 1675 surveyors in north carolina i'm like holy moly for but it's wow. like 10.9 million people in the state but it worked out to like one in 4200 i'm like Holy crap, because the whole West, if you look, the West average is like one in 7,800. Um, but most of the public states, like a, we're one in 11,000. Um, California is one in 11,000. Arizona is one in 11,000. Like some of these some of these other states, Washington is one in 11,000. But I was kind of shocked when I ran the numbers for Utah. Like the amount of Utahs and sorry, we kind of side rail in the conversation. But <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> 462 surveyors in in uh utah so it, i do break that shit out by per square mile <laughs> so <laughs> somebody asked me about per square inch and i'm like i'm not going that far <laughs> so the one, the one no. thing that the one no. thing i'd like to point out here about a lot of these discussions is that uh the amount of research that, that goes in behind your survey can make a lot of difference. And I, I find myself uh, going back sometimes as much as 50 or 100 years almost to uh, to uh, documents that, that prove the location of, of something that's, that's out there today. And uh, so you just almost can't do too much uh, a research on a project and I learned that very quick when I was a young surveyor and I, I came within just hours of, of making a mistake that would have completely maybe bankrupted the engineering company that I was working with because it involved a multi-million dollar piece of property <laughs> and uh uh the the draftsman that was working on the thing uh, had a had a sixty foot strip that uh, had a road built on it, and he he had it labeled as Natural Resources Drive sixty foot R slash W. And uh, the afternoon before I delivered that, I discovered when going back over my research that that was owned by the state of Arkansas. And they weren't required to provide a plat to the city of Lura that dedicated that as a street. And so it had a Caribbean gutter street built on it, and it had a street sign on the corner, but it wasn't a street necessarily. And I ran out to the draftsman, and I said, you right, yeah, erase that R slash W off this thing right now. <laughs> and I'll compose a note to put on there. The next morning, the people that were buying this uh, multi-million-dollar piece of property came by to pick up the survey and some other things that this engineering company was providing them. And I was passing out the plats uh, in a fancy uh, uh, room, and uh, I called their attention to this note about this 60-foot strip. And that was the only access to this property. Mm -hmm. And the guys looked kind of green. And I said, is there a problem? 
And he said, we closed on this yesterday. Oh. And they had bought a multi-million dollar piece of property with no access. Oh. And had, had I delivered that survey the, the day before, as soon as the ink got dry on it, I might have been in very big trouble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there was no no end to research that I did after that close call. And I never let myself be rushed into producing a survey until I was satisfied with the research that had been done. And so you take that wherever you want to, but that was my close call and I didn't need a second one. Yeah. Well, Brian, you've got your hand up. Well, yeah, I just had a really quick story and I, I not to pick on you, James, but I thought it was kind of funny, 50 to 70 years. Um, so everything in Connecticut has been surveyed at one point in time or another. And so right around the eight, mid 1800s or so, mid to late 1800s, everybody moved west for the gold rush. And so there was a lot of descriptions that were just the butters and you had to hold occupation line. But if you take it back past that time period, you can find some really good descriptions with uh, meets and bounds in them. I know you guys aren't necessarily meets and bounds states like I am, but so there's a block of time where everything is just crap in Connecticut, bounded north by Jones, east by Smith. But if you get past that point, you're going to find gold as far as being able to put deeds on the ground. Um, I just, it's, it's amazing how Connecticut was everything at one point in time was surveyed. So for, yeah. for what it's worth, um, and it, to speak to your point of going back and research, you know, sometimes you have to go back to 1820, 1780. Mm -hmm. You know, one of, one of the things that I've been impressed with here is uh, all of you people in other states have it so easy compared to what we have in Arkansas. And and that goes from the point of uh, surveys are recorded at the county level and they are indexed by the person's name who owned the property and the name of the surveyor at the time. So if you want to know whether uh, your property has been surveyed before or an adjoiner has been surveyed before, you need the name of all of the owners going back 40 or 50 years <laughs> and the name of all of the surveyors in there and try to match that up. It's an impossibility. I can guarantee you it is an impossibility. You cannot find a survey that has been done on an adjoining piece of property in Arkansas unless you did what I did. And I spent, I don't know how many rainy days uh, and non-work days uh, in the courthouse going from page to page on every single survey from 1895 and noting the location of that survey and put it into a, a card index so that That's I could go back and do the thing. And That's it took me several years to do that. It's got to be worth a gazillion dollars, James. <laughs> <laughs> I still remember lost the court case because of it. <laughs> oh, so okay. just not to harp on Connecticut, but we are not on the county system. We are one of two states that's on the, the town system, uh, us in Rhode Island, everybody else, or at least around by me, is on the on the county system. So we have 169 different systems that we have to work through, uh, as opposed to uh, at the county level. So um, if you need to do research in Waterford with the town that I'm in, you go to the Waterford Town Hall. If you need to do research in Waterbury, you go to Waterbury Town Hall. That's the only, and mm. it's just different. That that is that's neat. That's I didn't know that. That's thanks for sharing that. So the real question is, let's end it here. But uh, Brian, is the cat on the desk or on the lap? Oh, <laughs> uh, the, the cat the, the, the took off. <laughs> that's Gooby. <laughs> they had to make an appearance. <laughs> we're we're pretty lucky here in Utah. Uh, we had our survey filing act that passed in 
uh, Jeremiah is going to correct me on this, 19, I want to say 86, but I think it was somewhere around there, between 80 and 86, I can't get the right number, but uh, older than that, you're not going to find much. Um, newer than that, most counties have now indexed that in some way. Um, rural counties, you still have to go to the courthouse to get it, but any of the big, what we call the big five or big six counties have them all online. And most of those are even GIS now. So yeah, I don't even have to leave my office to grab most surveys that I need from day to day. So yes, we are definitely spoiled here. <laughs> Okay, well, thanks everybody. We appreciate it. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Um, good, good for the 27th? Good for the 27th. Okay. Got it. Okay, thanks guys. Awesome, everybody. Have a good thanks, night. Thanks, y'all. Bye, guys. See you. Good night. Bye.